Thank you, Meltem. This is uh, the voice of Patrick Griffin, and we're going to talk about the future of payments and how Ripple sees the world evolving um, and our corporate strategy and, and how XRP is, is intimately integrated into it. So let's dive in. Uh, the agenda we're going to steer through will start with an overview of the emerging face of payments, uh, what will be driving customer demands in the future, some of the problems that we see inherent to servicing those payments today, our vision for what the future will look like uh, with a new infrastructure for, for cross-border payments, some of the solutions and tactics that we're taking to actualize our vision, and the traction uh, that we have today, and a little bit about our management team and our business. Moving right along, uh, we're going to talk about the new face of, of corporate payments. Today, the emerging payment companies are very much uh, digital marketplaces and on-demand platforms which are servicing a new breed of, of payment, payment types. These are corporates with distinct transactional needs that are largely and this is in stark contrast to corporates that uh, were really driving the emergence of cross-border infrastructure 40, 30 or 40 years ago with the development of SWIFT. Um, because their new needs are underserved by today's payments infrastructure, these new corporates are building, oftentimes, their own workarounds to what it would otherwise be an antiquated system. Uh, an often quoted chief product officer from, from Uber says that they're fast, that they are, they think about themselves as the fastest growing payments company to date. So let's look a little bit closer at what these companies look like. Um, these are businesses that have a global customer and global supplier base on day one. They think with a global mindset from inception. Their customers use a highly fragmented set of alternative banking services like mobile wallets. A, ca a good case in point is in India, uh, more, there are more mobile wallets than there are credit cards. The nature of their businesses is providing on-demand and real-time services. Uh, thus, the payments they process are high volumes of low-value payments at a high throughput. These are businesses that build on-demand instant, satisfa instant, instant satisfaction to their customers, and they are looking for products that can deliver payments in a, with a similar uh, service level. So examples of this are Amazon, Facebook, Uber, Apple. Amazon uh, today processes a billion items shipped on behalf of merchants in over 100 countries to customers in 185 countries. Facebook issues 50 million payments to developers annually. Uber is paying drivers in over 400 cities, and Apple is paying suppliers and 700, 785 suppliers in over 31 countries. So what is the problem with the infrastructure that we have today? Again, these are companies that need to process payments real time, instantly, and at a, on a low value basis. But the infrastructure we have was designed for something entirely different, a corporate that would send transactions internationally, infrequently, irregu in, 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 irregularly. Uh, think back to, again, the 1970s when the current infrastructure we have was built today. Uh, the infrastructure we have is designed to process the opposite of what our corporate, of what new corporates need. Corporates need high volume, low value transactions, but the infrastructure we have is just the opposite. It's for high value or batch payments, uh, and those are transactions that are moved through a network of correspondent banks or intermediaries, which effectively provide uh, slowness and, and, and uh, difficulties in processing payments uh, between, between one another. So the process of cross-border cross banking today is route, routed through a network of correspondent banks. Each link in the chain creates risk, costs, and time delays, and oftentimes uh, is, is quite frequent uh, to see errors and, and issues in, in processing payments. Up to 12% of international payments today have, have errors. To better service payments today, uh, Banks that are, that are delivering payment products and payment capabilities need to have global reach. But just the opposite is happening at the macro level. No player, not even HSBC, JP Morgan, or Citi has true global reach. Uh, compliance and other costs prohibit many banks from operating in certain markets. Uh, the graph that you're seeing on the screen is illustrating correspondent banking relationships in the Eurozone, which have halved in just the last decade. At, at the same time, the countervailing trend is, is an emerging e-commerce uh, ecosystem which has grown more than 900 times uh, over the last decade. Uh, 
this is largely, of course, fueled by, again, these emerging co corporates, which are largely digital marketplaces and on-demand platforms. It really shows that the existing infrastructure that we have to service global payments is underserving the new payments demand uh, in the new face of the emerging corporate. As a workaround, many corporates are simply have to go out and build their own discrete integrations and, and uh, payment services capabilities. Uh, this is a major cost center and pain point for new corporates trying to make international payments. Just to give you one example, Amazon has over 126 integrations into different payment systems around the world. To alleviate a lot of the cost of doing that, there are several intermediaries which are uh, standing in the middle of transactions to make cross-border and cross-network payments simpler. But of course, this is coming at a significant cost. Uh, payments companies like PayPal and Visa deliver cross-border payments capabilities, but at a margin of sometimes 20 to 48 to 20 to 40 percent. It's a very expensive intermediary solution. Moving on to our vision, we think that the, what, what the world really needs is new modern uh, IP-based payments infrastructure. So just like the Internet's design, a global distributed network of servers that use a common, open, neutral protocol. We think blockchain is the catalyst uh, to a future where money will move like information. We, we call this the Internet of Value. So this is a state in which the world will be able to move money as easily and expensively, flexibly and securely as it communicates on the Internet today. And so what will Ripple's role be in this, in this future world? We view our, our role as, as providing a, a service of routing transactions, uh, a data server that routes payments through the fastest, least cost path across any networks or geographies. So you can think about Ripple's ambition and our vision and our future to be really more something like the FedEx of money, a universal interface, uh, optimizing uh, the netting of, of payment flows, providing tracking and delivery of confirmation, and in some cases charging premiums for speed. So our, our long term, our large ambition is really to be, and the opportunity that we have here, is to be a payments player with truly global reach, a, a, the largest global payment service. If Ripple succeeds, uh, we, we think we will very much change the face of the markets currently taking margin in the middle of transactions. So moving on to our solution and, and how we're going about uh, building towards our, our vision. Our solution starts with our core technology that, unlike any other blockchain provider, employs the Interledger Protocol, or ILP. The Interledger Protocol allows for transactions to settle atomically in real time across networks. What I mean by atomically is the transactions either settle at once or not at all. So there are several benefits to this. Uh, and the three, the three benefits that I'll point out uh, are, are really the underpinning of all of our product offerings and everything we're doing today. The first is about eliminating settlement leg risk and delays as payments move from one network to another. Payments in, in, in the Interledger protocol are instant. This facilitates high velocity and high volume payment processing and the ability to transact for transactions to settle through multiple ledgers at once. So the Interledger protocol is not just about moving value from one ledger to another ledger, it's about moving value across ledgers with many ledgers in between, all with the ability to settle transactions as one. But the Interledger protocol is just a protocol. This is just technology. A, a technology and a protocol alone are just building blocks. They allow us to build the necessary features to efficiently process low-value payments across networks for the first time. We've designed a tailored set of features for interbank cross-border transactions. We package them into an enterprise-grade solution we call Ripple Connect. Uh, and Ripple Connect is sold to banks to allow them to process low-value payments with other banks around the world. On the schematic here, you can see these icons of banks with the blue boxes under, underpinning them. That's, that's there to represent connection points to the Interledger protocol through Ripple Connect. So when we ship Ripple, we accomplish two things. We wire banks into the Interledger protocol first. And the second thing is we wire the networks those banks are connected to into the Interledger protocol. So a payment going between two banks is, is also, a, with our technology, is able to be relayed into the networks that those banks are connected to. So on the illustration here on the graphic, you see ACH, Alipay, PayPal, Visa, 
The idea here is that a bank connected to the ACH network using Ripple Connect can send a transaction into the PayPal network or the Alipay network through the banks that are running Ripple Connect and are in turn connected to those, those networks. Of course, a common protocol makes it possible to build a single product interface to service all global cross-network payments. And that's really our vision. So to draw an analogy, where Stripe solves pay-ins with a streamlined interface, Ripple is solving global payouts. And maybe just to spend a little bit, a little bit longer on the right-hand side, what we're showing here is how we're connecting disparate networks through our solutions. We've also built solutions for third-party traders like hedge funds, market makers, corporates. DCG is a, is a good example of, of a firm trading uh, within our technology to sell their liquidity and provide competitive FX. This levels the playing field for every node connected to the interledger. So to fully optimize their connections to the interledger, uh, even further, traders and banks use the digital asset XRP to tighten spreads and reduce liquidity needs. So Patrick, this is Meltem. We have a question. Um, XRP, is that similar to Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies? Could you briefly just explain um, the role of XRP within the Ripple network? That's a great question. Leading the witness, uh, we're going to talk about XRP in the next couple of slides here, and hopefully that will address uh, most of the questions, but certainly we'll, we're happy to revisit uh, where there, there are gaps. So once again, uh, the Ripple technology in our software stack is a, a critical component is the ability for third parties to trade their liquidity and provide competitive FX rates to all the nodes connected to the Interledger protocol. This is all about leveling the playing field for all, all uh, banks and corporates and payment originators uh, to access cheap liquidity and compete on, on equal footing. Uh, again, a, an optimization of, of liquidity provi provisioning on the Ripple ne network is XRP. And the role of XRP uh, we'll get into in, in, in detail uh, just on the next couple slides here. So the first thing is digital assets are uniquely universal and, and simply because of the nature of their underlying tech infrastructure. These are uh, assets that exist on a distributed global ledger or a blockchain. And so the unique universality of these assets a lot enable fast settlement and, and, uh, and the finality of settlement. So we can apply them to interbank settlement use cases to make liquidity provisioning less expensive and more scalable. Today, banks service payments in different currencies by funding accounts with counterparty banks in different currency markets. These accounts are called NOSRA accounts. It's the image that you see on the left side of the screen. By consolidating liquidity from many disjointed international NOSRA accounts into one XRP pool, banks and traders allocate less total liquidity to service the same volume of global payments. So here's how that works in a little bit more detail. A bank only has to hold its domestic currency and maintain one account on the XRP ledger. So this is the, the image, the graphic we're seeing on the right side. Of course, XRP exists on a ledger that is transnational without a central operator. The bank only needs enough XRP on hand to service its largest expected payment obligation. By making markets directly between its domestic currency and XRP, the bank minimizes the number of intermediaries involved, their markup on spreads, the reconcilia reconciliation costs with their counterparties, and any regulatory capital offsets. We've seen banks realize cost savings beyond 60% when they use XRP into the, in their payment flows. So Patrick, this is, may, may we ask a question on the last slide? Absolutely. And we had a few questions pop up, so I thought we could address them before we moved on. So you just mentioned that you're um, working with banks and they've seen up to 60% cost reduction through using XRP for global FX management and for um, the movement of money. So one question from GVOC on the line was, how do you think about selling this in your role particularly to banks who typically have been able to charge transaction fees are they selling this as a premium service, or how do banks really think about the value proposition of using XRP to improve liquidity and to improve transaction time? Yeah, so this is purely about cost savings uh, to start with. So banks that are operating, transaction banks that are operating with no stroke accounts all over the world incur significant costs in, in their payment processing business. 
and that's, that's largely driven by reconciliation issues, so uh, reconciling errors, investigations, uh, liquidity positions with counterparties is a huge cost to banks. Um, there are errors that go into the system that, that, are, that result in liquidity charges to banks. The, the capital that goes into running a global payments business or a transaction bank is, is, is quite significant. And what they, when they look at XRP, they see a streamlining of their back office. They see a way to, rather than having many Nostra accounts, many accounts with different currencies, and all the exposures that they incur, they can streamline that all through a position with a, di a global digital asset, in this case XRP, uh, which allows them to transfer in real time value from one country in one currency to another country in another currency without having to pre-fund, open credit lines, and all the operational overhead of having a Nostra account. So the first thing they think about is how can I cut costs out of my bank to expand margin? The second thing that they'll think about is once I've cut those costs out, what are new opportunities that are emerging on the back of that? And in, a large, in large part, that has to do with the ability to service new payment classes and new payment types more profitably. So the, the start of, our, of this presentation talked about low value payments. It is very difficult to service low value payments when your whole back office is basically managed with a, a network of Nostro and Vostro accounts that are funded cyclically, maybe at the end of the week or the end of the month. Um, and having the, the forecasting wherewithal and the ability to manage liquidity is a very difficult thing to do on a, on a low value basis. What Ripple and XRP allows you to do is to process payments individually, low value, real time. So that opens up all sorts of new opportunities for transaction banks to pursue things like retail remittances, low value corporate disbursements, low value uh, corporate uh, payments to supply chain, uh, again, going to the digital marketplace examples as, as well. So it's, it allows banks to go after a, a class of, of uh, payments and customers that they're currently unable to do given the current liquidity infrastructure they have combined with the SWIFT, SWIFT network that they're using to credit and debit those, those accounts. Thank you, Patrick. Um, we have one more question, um, and this is pertaining to the security of XRP and using the Ripple network. So as you know, we really can't open a newspaper or go on Twitter today without hearing about hacks, whether it's SWIFT getting hacked, which is correspondent banking, or whether it's hacks on the cryptocurrency side. Could you speak briefly to some of the security implications of using the Interledger protocol, using the Ripple network, and using XRP? Yeah, so uh, we're going to talk in just the next slide here about kind of the distinctions between of XRP in contrast to certainly Bitcoin, Ethereum, and some of the uh, new architecture proposals that we've seen come out recently around bank-issued uh, digital uh, currencies. Um, the first thing is maybe to parse out ILP and XRP. ILP is a protocol that allows for the transfer of value from one ledger to another ledger. Effectively, it's just coordinating debits and credits between various systems in a way that is cryptographically secure. In other words, it's basic, the interledger protocol is designed to make sure that if one, one party on one ledger credits their system, that, the counter, that their counterparty in another ledger is debiting their system or vice versa, at exactly the same time. In other words, there's no scenario where counterparty A credits their network, but counterparty B doesn't debit their side, and so counterparty A loses the money. The interledger protocol using crypto cryptography and various cryptographic conditions ensures that when one side credits, the other side debits, and it's all happening as one transaction atomically. Um, so that's the protocol side, that's the interledger protocol. XRP is governed and, and exists as a native digital asset on the Ripple consensus ledger, which is it, itself a specific ledger. So again, interledger is about connecting all ledgers, regardless of whether they're bank ledgers, central bank ledgers, exchanges, or blockchains. The RIP XRP exists effectively on a blockchain. It's a distributed ledger that, it's, that it resides in. And so the security benefits and features and the architecture is certainly a technical discussion about and why is XRP and the Ripple consensus ledger itself a secure and viable institutional network? Um, and that's something that we can maybe touch on, on on this slide. 
So if this is, a, again, a, compar a comparison and contrast slide about XRP versus other digital assets um, in, in the context of you know, how can we use digital assets for global interbank settlement. And we'll touch on the security question uh, as well. So the first thing is we'll talk about bank-issued digital assets. And so we group bank-issued and central bank-issued, which have been uh, certainly in the headlines in, in, in the last couple of weeks, together, and we call them bank-issued di bank digital assets. So the advantages we see with a bank-issued bank digital asset is that it is a digital asset issued by a central bank or bank or a consortium of banks and inherits the benefits of its widely trusted issuers and governance. Um, of course, the disadvantages are issues around reach and speed and risk. So on, on reach, a, a bank-issued or central bank-issued digital asset has limited reach. Banks that are not part of the issuing group or country will likely be unable or unwilling to use the digital asset because of political or competitive issues. So bank-issued digital assets then effectively add to the patchwork currency landscape that already exists today and sacrifices the digital assets inherently global reach. On the speed and risk side, backing a digital asset with cash or central bank reserves just creates a liability. This is, this is nothing new. Um, trading and settling liabilities will ultimately require the movement of cash across borders and that recreates today's system and undermines the faster settlement speeds of digital assets and blockchain technology. So, when we move on from bank-issued digital assets, which in effect are just bank-issued digital liabilities, let's look at, at true digital assets, uh, independent digital assets, and some of the advantages and disadvantages within them. So this is where we get into the world of you know, counterparty-free digital assets that exist on blockchains, Bitcoin, Ethereum, XRP. Uh, the advantages, of course, are, you know, I, we think very much, we believe that the global reach is the key advantage to these, these uh, systems. Independent digital assets enable global reach and accessibility, uh, glo enable global reach by the virtue of them existing transnationally. These are networks that are run on servers all over the world and uh, are, are, can, where value can be moved uh, across this global, global ledger. In addition, because these are systems without a central counterparty or central operator, accessibility um, is a key component. So accessing these technologies, accessing these systems enables them to facilitate scalable and less expensive liquidity provisioning. So let's talk about some of the disadvantages naturally that we see with Bitcoin and Ethereum in contrast to XRP. Uh, the first thing is, is the governance of Bitcoin and Ethereum. ET, the Bitcoin supply, transaction validation, and protocol are controlled by a handful of mining pools. Ethereum recently experienced a fork in the aftermath of the DAO ha hack. So there's just a couple of examples. I mean, when you look at both the Bitcoin and, and Ethereum networks, they are both run largely by uh, several mining pools in China. Um, and you know, from an institutional perspective, that might work for retail, but from an institutional perspective, that's definitely that, that represents a certain degree of system, systemic risk that's not viable for commercial adoption. From a speed perspective, Bitcoin settles, settlement takes about 60 minutes longer than XRP. And from a risk perspective, there are several issues that uh, BTC and Ethereum both represent. The first is exposure. Longer settlement times on uh, both the Ethereum network and the Bitcoin network creates, but it, the Bitcoin network in particular, creates exposures and risk that are simply not tolerable for any real transaction uh, flows for, coming from a large transaction bank. Uh, there are misaligned incentives. When we look at the Bitcoin miners, uh, Bitcoin in particular, Bitcoin miners want small block sizes, for example, but the system needs a large block size to scale. From a security perspective, Ethereum is an untested and incomplete system. In fact, it's even written in an unknown scripting language. So XRP stands apart in uh, three primary areas here that we're, we're touching on, again, governance, speed and the distribution of XRP. On, on the governance side, XRP and the Ripple consensus ledger that underpins it is run and operated by institutional validators. MIT and Microsoft are, are examples of that. All of our bank partners uh, run validators or connect to validators. We have closed 23 million ledgers, uh, which is in contrast to Bitcoin's roughly half a million. Uh, ledger closes or block closes. We've never had any major issues, no reverse payments, no lost transactions. 
Uh, and similarly, on as far as uh, proven governance, it, just like Bitcoin, we have about 11,000 code commits. Um, and so the technology has been vetted, it has been reviewed, it's open source, and we have a full-time staff here at Ripple dedicated to building out uh, a strong code base for XRP. Uh, apart from governance and security, this is the most efficient settlement uh, asset that exists today. Settlement takes five seconds. So in contrast to Bitcoin, which takes about an hour, Ethereum takes about anywhere from 15 to 30 seconds. Ripple is anywhere from three to five seconds to settle uh, for XRP transactions. And then the last piece is distribution. We're going to talk about that uh, on the next slide as well. But uh, XRP primarily goes to banks and liquidity providers who add utility to the overall network. And so let me explain what I mean by that. The XRP distribution model is designed as an incentive to reward competitive spreads against XRP. Today it's in live beta testing, and you can consider it proof of liquidity. Ripple pays a rebate to banks and traders when they offer liquidity in XRP order books at competitive rates. Cheap FX rates, of course, attract more customers. More customers generate more XRP volume. More volume drives down FX rates, further accelerating Ripple's network effects. So instead of enriching a handful of miners who have cornered economies of scale on Bitcoin and Ethereum, Ripple pays for liquidity, which is valuable to every XRP holder, but more importantly, the broader utility of the network. So Patrick, this is Melton again. Um, based on the incentives for XRP distribution, one question was around the scalability of the interledger protocol. Uh, from Jackson, we have the question, do settlement times increase if adoption increases? So if there's more throughput on the interledger protocol, does that slow down transactions? Yeah, so let me first reiterate the point that the interledger protocol is a separate technology than the XRP system. So the XRP, like XRP and the, and the blockchain it resides on is, is not unlike Bitcoin and the blockchain it resides on or Ethereum and the blockchain it resides on. These are dedicated ledgers. So those are, those are, those are three examples of three ledgers. Um, the interledger protocol is purely a protocol. It's a, it's a set of rules, a standard set of rules that dictate how and when one party on one ledger will, de will, will debit and credit its system and one party on another ledger will de debit and credit its system. So it's a protocol, it's not a blockchain, it's not a ledger, it's not a database. It's just a protocol set of standards and rules. So the interledger protocol scales infinitely. It can sc scale horizontally to, to Run another ILP enabled ledger just simply means setting up another server. The speed of, wit of, com of confirmation is, a con is constrained only by the counterparties involved in an interledger transaction. So in other words, you can have GetGo on one side and Virtu on the other, both trading at high frequency. So long as their systems are high frequency they, and they're, they're submitting their transactions and their trades to the rule set that is laid out in the interledger protocol then they can process at a high frequency and with unlimited scale. Uh, XRP, in contrast, is a database and has constraints, just like Bitcoin or Ethereum. Uh, and those constraints are you know, what we talked about, about settlement in five seconds. Um, and you know, there's, there are other constraints as any database is constrained. Thank you. Okay, so let's talk about uh, traction to date. So we, we, we set out our vision, the solution, the tactics we're taking to implement that uh, towards that vision. And here are a few slides on just some of the traction we've made in the market. So the first thing is, you know, we've made a lot of traction building the network that will supply global payments infrastructure to the world. We've started to connect payment networks by focusing our enterprise product offering to banks. We're driving adoption amongst two broad segments. It's really simple. We focus uh, on large banks with one set of value propositions and small banks with another set of value propositions. But ultimately all leveraging the same enterprise product that we are delivering. So to give you a sample of some of our customers that we've recently made uh, public, um, at the top here you see some examples of tier one global banks, Santander, CIBC, UBS, Unicredit, Mizuho. Uh, tier two or three banks uh, below that, so ATB and Risa Bank recently just did a cross-border payment between uh, Canada and Germany in about eight seconds. 
uh, without involving any intermediary global correspondent bank. Um, NBAD and CBW are examples of banks in, here in the US and in the Middle East. So we have a global enterprise sales team uh, with offices in five locations all over the world uh, that is designed to sell uh, Ripple Connect and our software stack to these, these banks for low value payment processing. And we have a large client services and delivery organization that stands behind them, goes on site, architects solutions, and, and deploys the software. In addition, we also scale our implementation and delivery capabilities through some strategic partnerships that we have with several consulting and, and systems integration firms, namely Accenture, Deloitte, and CGI. Uh, we also ship our product through technology partners. Uh, CGI, Earthport, DNH, Expertis, and Volante are examples of companies that sell uh, and have been in this business for, for a long time, selling core systems and payment processing hubs to banks. Uh, they are shipping their, their products uh, into, with Ripple Connect, our software stack, integrated into their basic offering, which means that we can scale into their existing client base uh, with a simple upgrade. So a little bit about our business uh, and our management team. Uh, I'll call out a couple of notables here. Chris Larson is the, 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 the co-founder. Um, of Ripple, this is his third fintech company. Previously uh, started eLoan, which is the first online lender, and then went on to start Prosper, which is the first peer-to-peer -peer lender. Uh, Brad Garlinghouse has, uh, is our COO, has had many er successes at uh, several early internet uh, companies, including at Home Networks, AOL, and Yahoo. Uh, Stefan Thomas is a, uh, an early Bitcoin developer. He created actually the Bitcoin JS, as our CTO here on staff, and, and the what the primary architect behind the Interledger protocol. And then just in terms of our board of directors and advisors, uh, certainly Susan Athey is a, noted, is a notable economics professor from, from Stanford that often speaks and lectures on uh, the blockchain and the promises of distributed financial technologies. Gene Sperling is a, a former, well, actually is the former National Economic Council director for both Presidents Clinton and Obama and sits on our board. Um, and maybe just a little note about, about our investors. Uh, we shared an investor with, uh, with DCG in, in Chicago Mercantile Exchange. SBI Holdings uh, is, a, is an investor from Japan. Uh, and Santander uh, was a notable tier one bank in our, our last round of financing. So with that, I will turn it over to questions and uh, open up the floor. Excellent. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start with some of the questions that were posed while you were speaking, Patrick. So I tried to sort of bucket them by theme. So let's go back one step to talk about XRP. Um, we have a handful of participants with us today who are investors in cryptocurrencies or cryptocurrency traders. So um, we'd like to start by asking some questions about the XRP ecosystem. So um, first and foremost, um, the, the biggest question that came up several times was, today, if you're interested in buying, selling XRP, is there an ecosystem that you're building around XRP as a currency? Will there be more wallets, more exchanges that enable trading of XRP? And what is really the plan to start building liquidity in this market? So uh, thank you for the question. So the first, the first uh, part of that answer is that there, on Ripple.com there is a a portal, a guide for buying XRP, which is uh, currently available. Again, go Ripple.com and it will navigate you to um, ways to buy XRP. The second piece is that absolutely we we are actively engaged in integrations and uh, to list XRP at some of the top five cryptocurrency exchanges to date. Um, which will certainly make the uh, purchasing of XRP more and more and more streamlined as we make progress there. Excellent. Um, next question is around the link between XRP and Ripple as a company. So given that XRP is such a critical component of Ripple, um, will XRP grow with Ripple or to ask the inverse, is Ripple's success linked to the success of XRP? So, so that, that is a, a, an interesting question, certainly, for, um, that you know, we, we talk about a lot here. It is, without a doubt, uh, XRP is in, intricately in, involved and intertwined into the success of our business. 
Uh, as you can see, a, a, we are in the networks business, and our ability to successfully deploy, to deploy technology hinges on uh, the, the network connectivity and the reach of the system. So to the extent that there are other banks and other countries and other networks that makes the system more useful, to do that, the system needs to be a cheaper and more efficient place to transact. And XRP has a critical role in driving network effects. Um, again, because we are able to effectively purchase liquidity using XRP, we can buy cheaper rates, bring in liquidity. Uh, liquidity is the cornerstone to network effects in any financial services business, and that lets us uh, accelerate and, and unlock a key part of uh, our network effects and, and network growth story. Excellent, thank you. Um, another question around sort of the relationship between XRP and banks and the customers you're serving. So one concern was around how will Ripple address KYC and AML, particularly given the association of cryptocurrencies as sort of a currency that can be used for criminal activity. Um, and then the second piece to that question is as um, banks start using XRP, um, are they ever exposed to currency or FF, FX risks, pardon, using XRP? Okay, so the first piece, it, it, the, the short answer there is that, um, again, Ripple is an enterprise software company. We ship software, pro software to banks. Uh, banks use our software, customers, banks are processing the transactions. Ripple is itself not a money transmitter or payment processing business. And so the port of call for any regulator in investigating you know, where the transaction went, who was involved in the transaction, the port of call is, is, our, is our, actually our customers, not, not, Ripple, uh, not Ripple Inc. And so our customers have our, our banks. They are regulated entities, uh, and they are responsible for KYC onboarding, AML, BSA, and all the required due diligence checks on any transaction. Uh, the second piece to that is uh, XRP is designed to be an institutional settlement asset. So we have a bit license from the state of New York to sell XRP specifically for that use case. We could sell XRP to, it, to service inter-financial institution settlement. And that's really the, the objective of, of XRP today. Um, and we have, are a regulated uh, entity that does that uh, and sells XRP uh, to financial institutions. The second part of your question uh, is about uh, exposure uh, and banks that, um, you know, what happens when a bank takes XRP on balance sheet and how do they manage uh, volatility exposure. So the first thing I would say here is that uh, XRP is, is the fastest uh, digital asset uh, from a settlement perspective. So transactions can move in and out of XRP in less than five seconds. Um, so if from, a, from a maximum exposure perspective, we're talking about five seconds of exposure. Even that, uh, digital assets are certainly a volatile asset class, uh, and banks need to be able to hedge off any, any risk they take on their balance sheet. Um, and so this has been public, and we have announced a, um, a, a, a partnership with crypto facilities to launch a hedging futures uh, contract against XRP, which allows financial institutions uh, to price in volatility risk and hedge off any exposures they have, just like they would with any asset they take on their balance sheet. Thank you, Patrick. So now I think we're going to move a bit to um, the bank use case and move away from XRP as a currency. So one of the questions we're getting, and I know you've walked through this example a bit, but could you just revisit from a international transaction perspective how a transfer from bank A in one country to bank B in another country would take place using the Ripple network? Okay, so there, there are, uh, again, there's, the, the nuance here is it really depends on the type of customer. So I'll start with a large bank. So you can imagine a large transaction bank that has a, a, a book of business overseas with operating companies in those uh, regional, uh, in those jurisdictions. So you can imagine a bank here in the U.S. that has an operating entity in, or a business in Japan. And so that bank will lay out capital in, and deploy liquidity 
to a counterparty in Japan and open up an account in yen, and their counterparty will have an account with that bank in the US in dollars. And then they'll use the SWIFT network to coordinate debits and credits against those positions. Periodically, the bank in the US will have to rebalance and top up their account with more yen. This also works on the system of credit, uh, but just for the, the discussion here, we'll just envision this as a pre-funded system. Uh, our, pri our, our primary technology and our offering today, using Ripple Connect and using our software, is simply a, a, an improvement on their ability to process payments between those managed accounts. So a tier one bank that has the, the business rationale to open up a Nostra account and maintain a Nostra account, so maybe it's because they have a lot of transaction flow going into that corridor, will simply continue to, to manage liquidity the way they're, they're managing liquidity and use the Ripple technology, which coordinates the, the settlement between different counterparties, uh, to better control their liquidity overseas, bringing down their processing costs, and allowing them to tap into a new payment category, which is low value transaction processing. So that's tier one banks. Tier two banks actually are interested in a different, uh, are, are interested in the liquidity services that we offer. So a tier two bank or tier three bank that has to go through a large player like a JP Morgan is interested in not having to go through a large player like a JP Morgan. So our technology allows, again, a tier three or tier two bank to, on a real-time basis, purchase liquidity or cash inventory overseas. So you can imagine a trading firm in Japan that has, has long yen is offering to sell their yen to buy dollars. Well, tier three bank in the US can now purchase that, that yen with execution instructions and delivery instructions to move that yen over the Japanese rail and service the payment in Japan. And again, all of that can be serviced on a real time, low value basis. So the value proposition for a tier three player is more about equal footing, equal access, level playing field, tapping into a competitive liquidity exchange without having to route transactions through correspondent banks and and third-party intermediaries. Thank you. So just to um, piggyback off of that question, um, we have a question about a developing markets. So one of the comments in the, the question box was that Ripple seems to really present a great use case for developing economies. So for people who are in that business, how do we spread Ripple to developing markets to get banks in India, Bangladesh, other developing economies to come on board to the Ripple network. Um, your insights from where you sit, Patrick, what is the best way to do that? Well, the, the, so we, we, al we already have an extensive list of clients uh, around the world. Uh, we, we're working with over 100 banks today. Um, and the, many of those banks have global operations. Some are, have regional operations dedicated to uh, countries like uh, in, in India, and South Asia, and parts of Africa, and Middle East. Um, and in parts of some parts of Latin America. Great. And then a follow-on question to that: If people want to partner with Ripple or are interested in learning more from a sales perspective, what is the best way to get in contact with your team at Ripple to have further conversations? I, just go, going to Ripple.com, our, our URL. Uh, there's a, a customer narrative that will walk you through to uh, the right the right contact touch points within our organization. Excellent. Um, so going back to questions around Ripple, um, and we have another question around sort of bank implementation and how Ripple fits into the existing correspondent banking system. Uh, one of the questions here is around how Ripple um, would look in an implementation case. Typically, what is the timeline to implement Ripple Connect within a bank? And then the follow-on to that question is, once um, Ripple Connect is implemented with banks, what is the Ripple roadmap for expanding that network to start realizing the vision you outlined at the start of the presentation? So, uh, so I, the the second part of your question, you might have to repeat because it, it broke up a little bit. But um, why, why don't I answer the first one uh, at the top? So, the the deployment of Ripple Connect or our enterprise software to banks again depends. It varies. It varies depending on the bank. So, as you can imagine, large banks with complex uh, core systems and payment processing uh, infrastructure inside their bank 
have more architecture, more business planning, more logic required to deploy Ripple Connect and integrate it. And that, of course, changes depending on if you know, we're shipping Ripple Connect in isolation or whether we're shipping that through one of our channel partners. So just to give a, a, a rule of thumb, it typically will take about three to six months, depending on the size of the bank, uh, to deploy Ripple Connect. And again, that's, I think the caveat there is that that is for a full-scale commercial deployment. That's not a POC, that's not a pilot. If we can do POCs in a matter of weeks and pilots in maybe a month or so. Uh, but a, a full-scale commercial deployment takes about three to six months. Thank you. And then the second question was, as the Ripple ecosystem grows, I think in the earlier part of the presentation, you outlined a very compelling vision for the role Ripple could play in global payments infrastructure going forward. Um, from your perspective, what is sort of the roadmap to helping Ripple achieve that vision? What are some of the key next steps, and what are the things that we should be looking out for as individuals who are excited about Ripple? So uh, the first thing here is that you know, we, we do believe that we're in, in a phase of kind of groundwork. We're laying the groundwork to connect the, the, key, the, core, the key parts, the, 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 the cornerstone of the financial, uh, the financial services landscape to a common protocol. Uh, so we very much are aggressively pursuing a, the build out of an interbank network um, between all, all of our banking customers, tier one, tier two, tier three. The use case that we're very specifically focused on is low-value cross-border interbank payments. So I, yeah, I think it's important for us and in, in in what is challenging from a marketing sales perspective for us is to our, be able to articulate why low-value is the future. Low-value cross-border is the future. The, 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 the days of processing transactions and, and batch file transfers that take days and sometimes weeks to process is simply no longer tenable for the new class of corporates that are emerging today that have to satisfy you know, on-demand, real-time payments that are moving along against on, real-time, on-demand product delivery. Uh, so again, I, I think that uh, that story, that narrative, is a key part of our, of our company's success and our technology's success. Um, and you know, probably a second part of that is you know, how do we scale our network. Again, today we are we are uh, in pole position. We have the largest pipe client pipeline to date. We have shipped products in commercial production. No other blockchain company in the world can say that. Um, and we have a a very robust stable of systems integrators and technology partners that are shipping Ripple Connect and our and our enterprise software to date. And all that is about building a network. Um, and so. Well, while we're doing that on our own and through our channel partners, we also are working with consortium of banks to build uh, network rules, membership rights, you know, new technologies, new payment network capital N uh, that make this commercially viable at scale uh, without having to deploy trans these the software one by one by one. And so I think that's probably the next phase of our, of our business and how we think about uh, accelerating network effects is building a networks of software and technology, uh, again, networks capital N, payment rules, membership, functional standards, uh, and things of that, of that nature. Thank you. Um, we are running close to out of time, but since we started five minutes late, we'll just take one or two more questions. So if anyone has to depart, please drop off um, whenever you you need to. Um, Patrick, will, are you okay with one or two more questions? Not a problem. All right. Um, so we have a great question here about the nature of the Ripple network. So one of the questions that's come up in various different iterations is really the network nature of Ripple. Um, how do you deal with transactions with a bank which is not within the Ripple network? Um, is there any risk of Ripple becoming exclusionary in nature, or how do you think about that interconnectivity between bank entities? Uh, so, so the first thing is that your banks today, they process payments on a bilateral basis. They're, the transactions are, are always governed, payment, legal commercial transactions are always governed by a legal commercial framework. So anytime a bank moves money from point A to point B, it's through a payment network or it's through a bilateral relationship that one bank has with another bank that lays out all their commercial terms of processing 
payments together. Uh, so when we when we look at um, our business and we think about uh, what's a siloed network, what's not a siloed network, we, we sort of actually would we we step out of that that debate. We don't think there will be one ledger, one network to rule all networks. Instead, what we've designed is a protocol which can move value from one system to another system. Whether one system's closed, another one's open, we frankly are are not in the in the fray. We're not arguing what the case of one one or the other. Uh, we think that there are plenty of credible cases to be made for private, centralized, closed systems as well as open, distributed um, blockchains. So we prefer to think about a, a web of ledgers that are interconnected through a protocol, and the software that enables that, I think, is the, is the critical piece that um, you know, we are delivering on today. Thank you. Um, and with that, I think we have answered a, a lot of great questions. Um, today. So thank you very much, Patrick, for answering all of them and for giving us such a thorough overview. We have gotten several requests from various attendees about sharing some of the Q&A and about sharing the presentation. Um, we will internally review and we'll send out an email following this webinar um, to let you know whether or not we can do that. So please stay tuned. Um, with that, I want to take a moment to thank Patrick and to thank Monica for sharing their time with us today. Thank you very much for informing us, educating us, and sharing more about Ripple. And then again, I'd like to reiterate, if you have any feedback, if you have any perspectives on what was helpful, what you'd like to see more of, what you'd like to see us do differently, please email network at dcg.co, or you can email the uh, email address from which you received your invite today. We always welcome hearing feedback um, or reach us on Twitter. We're at DCGCO. You can also reach Ripple as well. But please let us know how you felt about this event and what we can do going forward. Anything from you, Patrick or Monica? Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much to Melton and DCG for organizing the, the webinar. All right. And when uh, and just a, a quick shout out because I know there was a question about how to get in touch. You can get in touch with us at ripple.com slash contact. Perfect. Thank you, Thank you too. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope the rest of your day goes well. And we look forward to seeing you at a conference or an event in the future. Again, Twitter is a great way to stay in touch with both Ripple and DCG. I know that I always see lots of great notifications from Ripple about all of the places they're presenting, going to, and lots of great articles, blog posts on their website as well. They're highly informative. Have a great afternoon, everyone. It's okay. Yeah, are you okay?